So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the drug discovery program that we have here at Harbor Branch and some of the work that we do. And to me, it, it really, the marine invertebrates are so, a sunken treasure. They are unbelievable, some of the compounds that they have. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you will agree with me that there are some incredible things at the bottom of the sea for us. So my... I just want to start with explaining what, not, what a natural product is. And it's basically a compound that is produced by an organism which is not essential for survival. But we believe it confers some sort of evol evolutionary advantage. So it, it really allows the, uh, who, whatever is producing it to reproduce better or to outcompete somebody for terrain, but it provides some sort of advantage. And um, it is also called a secondary metabolite. And nature is a source of a lot of medicines. Um, about 70% of the drugs that we currently use have their origin in some sort of natural product. They either is, they're either derived from a natural product or the natural product was used as a template to synthesize the drugs that are now used. And some examples of that are aspirin, um, uh, penicillin, morphine, cyclosporin, and taxol. So all of those came from a natural source. So why explore the oceans for medicines? Um, the oceans cover about 70% of the Earth's surface, so it makes sense to do this. Um, there are more than two 200,000 described species of plants and animals in the sea, and many believe as many to be described, as many as to be discovered. A small percentage of this has already yielded uh, more than 10,000 novel chemicals. And only a very small percentage of this has been tested for pharmaceutical potential. So this is really an untapped resource that we have for potential new drugs. And some examples of drugs that have made it to the, to the market is Jondalis or ectinocidin 743. This is an anti-tumor drug that is derived from a tunicate that is found in the Caribbean and Mediterranean seas. And I believe it's also found here nearby in Fort, in Fort Pierce. And Amy actually helped um, elucidate the structure of this compound. Um, this compound was approved in, in Europe, and um, it's also been approved here by the FDA to treat soft tissue sarcoma and ovarian cancer. And it works by causing cell death of cancer cells by preventing their proliferation. Another marine um, compound that is being used as a drug is halibut or eribulin. So this is the fully synthetic analog of the marine sponge natural product halichondrin B. It comes from the halichondria sponge. And eribulin prevents cell division leading to cancer cell death. And it was approved by the FDA last year to be used to treat metastatic breast cancer in patients that had already undergone two different kinds of chemotherapy. Um, so it has very specific um, usage right now, but it has been approved for, uh, by the FDA. And I'm going to tell you a few highlights uh, about, from our program here at the Marine Biomedical and Biotechnology Research. We have about a library of about 17,000 different microorganisms and about 32,000 specimens collected throughout the world. Out of those, we have, uh, they have isolated about 150 pure compounds, and we have about 5,000, and that number is increasing through some of Amy's grants, enriched peak library fractions, and I will tell you in a second what we mean by those. Um, some of you might have heard of the compound discodermolite. Discodermolite um, comes from discodermia sponge, and it went all the way to clinical trials and um, it didn't quite make it, but we're hoping that new research has shown um, that it can still be used. And one of the things that is really interesting about this codermolite is that it has the same mechanism of action as Taxol, but tumors that become resistant to Taxol are still responsive to this codermolite. So it makes a very interesting compound. At any given point, we have about 15 different compounds in the pipeline that we're studying for different reasons, whether we're trying to find a new activity for them or um, we're trying to figure out their structure or we're trying to understand more about their mechanism of action. And some of the compounds are currently under evaluation by pharmaceutical companies. So let me tell you a little bit more about who we are. Um, so we have three main groups in the marine biomedical and biotechnology research. We have the natural products chemistry group, which is led by Amy, and it 
um, does isolation and purification of secondary metabolites, so we get all our compounds from them. Um, they do chemical characterization of the compounds, so they figure out the structures. And they have worldwide collaboration to test against dreaded disease. So not only do they send it to Peter to test for anti-infective agents uh, and to me to test uh, for potential uses in pancreatic cancer, but to many other places that do uh, studies against other types of cancer and infectious disease such as leishmaniasis and even diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the Marine Microorganism Group is led by Peter McCarthy, and that does isolation and culture of marine microorganisms. They also ferment those micro, um, microorganisms to obtain secondary metabolites from them. Um, they test against um, infectious diseases such as MRSA and Clostridium difficile and um, other kinds of uh, infective agents. And they also are using the microbes for biotechnology applications. So microbes have um, a lot of different enzymes that can be used, for example, to produce biofuels in a, in a more efficient way. So Peter's group is also looking into that. Um, my group is a cancer cell biology group. And so we're trying to find potential new treatments for pancreatic cancer. So my group basically screens the compounds to see if they have these activities. And once we have a compound that has the activity, we try to figure out how the compound exerts this activity, which is what we call the mechanism of action. So cancer is a general name that is given to about 100 different diseases. What they have in common is that you have uncontrolled growth of cells that can be due to the fact that they cannot die or some other effects, and they have damaged DNA. And the damaged DNA could have been inherited, it could have been the result of exposure to chemicals or to infection from viruses or smoking or even sun exposure. We are particularly looking for potential cures for pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. Um, about 44,000 uh, people are expected to be diagnosed with this disease this year. Of those, only 26% of the people diagnosed will survive one year from diagnosis, and only 6% will survive five years after diagnosis. So I think these statistics highlight the urgent need for new treatments for this particular disease. And about 37,000 deaths are expected to happen this year from this disease. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the process that we follow. And so we were very lucky to have access to our research vessel and our um, submersible. And we were able to collect deep sea marine invertebrates. Um, we extracted these with solvents and then we did fractionation. So um, this is a rough scheme, but you can see different peaks and those represent different compounds present in there. Our chemists then prepare what we call peak library samples, and these contain mixtures of about, of about three or four compounds. And normally, we tend to screen with this, and if we find an activity, our chemists then follow that activity to isolate the pure compound responsible for that activity. And we are specifically looking at the connection between inflammation and cancer. And inflammation is a very normal process. You want to have this. And it is, it is a way that your body alerts your immune system that either a wound and a, or an infection exists. And this is a very busy slide. But what I wanted to highlight here is that all, all the cells of the immune system that are involved in the inflammatory response, so you have T cells, B cells, macrophages, eosinophils, mast cells, um, neutrophils. So all of these cells are involved in that response. And one important thing to pay attention to is that they all produce these soluble factors, cytokines or interleukins, and that's how they communicate with each other. So for example, this T cell, by producing these cytokines, will activate this B cell and that will cause this B cell to release antibody. In this case, it's releasing IgE. So IgE will go and activate mast cells and will cause, the, will cause them to degranulate. And if somebody here suffers from allergies, what I describe is the process that happens before you have all the symptoms for allergies. So, but why are we interested in inflammation and cancer? Well. As I said, inflammation is a good thing, but when inflammation doesn't resolve, it becomes a not very good thing. So chronic inflammation, uh, we just referred to it 
uh, to the constant inflammatory response by calling it chronic inflammation. And it leads to tissue injuring through the swelling. It, um, it creates that microenvironment. So all those soluble factors that I told you that the cells release, um, they seem to facilitate damaged cells to survive. So that is a, not a very good thing to have when you have a cell that is damaged. And the constant damage and, and repair increase cell turnover, which seems to facilitate um, uh, developing mutations. Uh, many adult cancers are frequently preceded by chronic inflammation. And it's, um, epidemiology studies have shown that long-term users of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin have reduced risk of developing um, such, uh, some cancers such as colon cancer, stomach cancer, and lung cancer. In pancreatic cancer, the other uh, applies. Uh, patients with pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas have a much elevated risk of developing uh, pancreatic cancer. So those that have hereditary pancreatitis seem to have 53 times higher risk than the normal population of developing pancreatic cancer. And those that have a sporadic um, chronic pancreatitis have about 17 times elevated risk of developing pancreatic cancer. So this led us to develop a hypothesis that we could find novel inhibitors of inflammation among our natural products derived from marine organisms due to their diversity, richness, and uniqueness. And the way we decided to follow this, uh, we knew that inhibitors of inflammation have the ability, well, would, could prevent pancreatitis from developing into, ca into cancer, into pancreatic cancer but it may also prevent the spread of the cancer into other organs or metastasis. So these two made it really important for us to try to find inhibitors of inflammation. And we decided to follow two approaches. One approach was to concentrate on mast cells and see whether we could prevent their migration or their degranulation. Our second approach was to focus on uh, regulation of inflammation. So we know that there are key molecules that control inflammation, such as interleukin-8, um, the signal transduction transducer and activator of transcription 3 or STAT3, and the nuclear factor kappa B. And if we focus on this, we may be able to regulate inflammation. So as I said, our first approach um, was to focus on mast cells. And as I said, those of you that have allergies know these cells incredibly well. They release the histamine. They give you all the nasty symptoms. Uh, but for those of you that may not know them, this is more or less what a mast cell looks like. Of course, it's a schematic. But they have these little um, circles that we call granules. And inside of them, they contain a lot of factors. So not only do they contain the histamine, but they contain growth factors. They contain factors that facilitate the production of new blood vessels. We call those angiogenic factors. And so anytime that these cells become activated, in this case, for example, for, by an antibody and allergens, you get what we call degranulation. So you release those granules and you release all those factors that are contained within them. But in pancreatic cancer, what has been shown is that if you have an inflamed pancreas, those inflamed cells release soluble factors such as interleukin-8 and CCL2 that attract the mast cell to the pancreas. Once the mast cell is here next to the inflamed cells, it becomes activated, it degranulates, and releases all those growth factors and uh, the blood vessel formation factors. And this microenvironment and the constant turnover of the, of the cells that are undergoing damage facilitates the progression into cancer. And once you have cancer, um, the microenvironment that the mast cells create can facilitate that cancer into becoming metastatic, a metastatic tumor. So our first approach was to try to see if we could inhibit the migration of the mast cells into the pancreas. I told you that one of the factors that attracts them is CCL2. And we know that pancreatic cancer cells release very large levels of CCL2 and also of interleukin-8. So if we incubated with our compounds, could we see a decrease in secretion? And the way we're measuring this is by using an assay called the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. And an ELISA works by having, so this is a 96 well plate, and we coat that with a capture antibody. So it's an antibody specific for the cytokine that we're interested, whether it's IL-8 or CCL2. And then we use a, a second antibody that we call a detection antibody that again recognizes this particular um, cytokine. 
And we use um, another thing that recognizes the detection antibody. In this case, a horseradish peroxidase linked antibody. And this horseradish peroxidase can react with a substrate and produce a color change. And we can follow the color change easily in the lab. So as I said, we, have, uh, we know that pancreatic cancer cells produce very large levels of um, CCL2, and we have what we call cancer cell lines in our lab. So these are whenever somebody has a tumor excise, um, the cells are grown in the lab, and then they're available for groups like me to use in our studies. And these cells tend to have the characteristics of the tumor that they came from. So one of these cell lines is the PANC1. So it is a pancreatic cancer cell line, and it produces very large levels of CCL2 without me doing anything to them. So I normally, to do this assay, I plate the cells and allow them to adhere overnight. The next day, I replace the media with fresh media that in the presence or absence of our marine compounds and their respective controls. I incubate for five hours to allow for the new production of CCL2. And then I take that media and I subject it to the ELISA assay that I just described. And then I take the cells and I lyse them and combine them with ethidium bromide. And ethidium bromide binds to DNA. So this gives me an idea of how much DNA is present, which is a measure of viability. I know since I put the same number of cells, if I see a decrease in DNA, I can tell whether my compounds kill the cells. And this is an example of what our results look like. So this is a screening for peak library samples. So all of these numbers that you, hear, you see here represent a peak library sample. Um, this is expressing percentage, and we're expressing a percentage of CCL2 expression. And it has been normalized to a control that we have a recombinant CCL2 that we use. Uh, when we put media that never saw cells, it, it has no CCL2, and that's our negative control. And we also have a drug control, which is curcumin which is the spice that is found in curry, and it is a CCL2 inhibitor. You just need to consume very large levels of curry in order to get that. But, but it is good for you, um, for those of us that like spicy foods. So, um, but as you can see, we had three library fractions, peak library fractions, that inhibited CCL2 secretion by um, our pancreatic cancer cells. So we screened about 500 peak library samples, and we got three fractions confirmed. They all contain the compound called discodermide, and which is represented here. And we're testing to see if discodermide has this activity. So we're very excited about this because it could be technically um, a chemo preventive. It, can, it might be useful in preventing the, for the development of pancre from pancreatitis into pancreatic cancer. So this is incredibly exciting for us. Well, the other approach that we're following for mast cells is a degranulation assay. So we have mast cells uh, that we can culture, and in the presence of calcimycin, uh, we can induce degranulation. And degranulation, as I said, releases a lot of factors. One of the factors that it releases is an, an enzyme called beta hexosaminidase. Um, and if we inhibit, uh, if we inhibit um, or degranulation, we get much less beta hexosaminidase uh, release. We can combine this um, beta -hexo hexosaminidase with its target, glucosaminide, and we get um, a reaction that produces a color change that we can easily track in the lab. And this is an example of a screening. So here we have controls. These are uh, pure compounds. This is from our pure compound library, again, at 5 micrograms per ml. And we're expressing this, again, as a percentage. But you can see that some of the compounds decrease the amount of degranulation that we're seeing. This assay is still not perfect. We're having a little bit of issue with our solvents. But it is coming up um, to be able to be used for screening. So we're very excited about being able to do this screening. And we're very excited about already already seeing um, some compounds that appear to have activity in them. So for our conclusions for mast cell inhibitors are that mast cell inhibitors have the potential to be chemopreventive um, in pancreatic cancer. And they might also be, um, they, they might be effective in, in stopping metastasis. We have identified three fractions with the ability to inhibit CCL2. And actually, my, my technician found some others today, so we're very, very excited about that. And um, the main compound present in these particular fractions appears to be discodermide, so we need to do functional assays to confirm the activity. And the screening for inhibitors of mast cell degranulation is starting, so we're very, very excited about that. 
So now we're, I'm going to introduce you to two key concepts in cell biology, and I use these words all the time, so I figure I better introduce them before I scare you to death. <laughs> so one of them is apoptosis, and the other one is signal transduction. And apoptosis it stands for program cell death. And it is a very normal process in which unnecessary cells or, or cells that become damaged or older can be destroyed. So anytime that a cell has finished its function, it can undergo this process and eliminate itself. It does it in a very clean way that doesn't damage any adjacent tissue, and it is a very good thing to have. But in cancer, this process can be disrupted, and it allows cells that, uh, to continue to live and multiply when they shouldn't. And many cancer cells are resistant to apoptosis. Actually, most pancreatic cancer cells are resistant to apoptosis. And an example of apoptosis is whenever you have an infection, you, can, um, you get many copies of the T cell that recognizes that, um, that infection to come and clean it up. But once that infection has been clear, the T cells undergo apoptosis. So at the end of the day, you have um, very few of them left because you don't want to have them there if you don't need them. So the second co the concept that I wanted you uh, want to introduce to you is signal transduction. And Wikipedia describes signal transduction as being, in biology, any process by which a cell converts one kind of signal or a stimulus into another. And cells use signaling cascades to start dividing, producing growth or angiogenesis factors, and also to undergo apoptosis. So this is very, very important. And my boss came up with a very good way of describing signal transduction. So let's say you order a pizza. You know, the delivery guy gets on his car and he follows the traffic signals. And if everything works well, the end result is you get a yummy pizza. You know, everybody's happy. But if the delivery guy gets in and the signals all of a sudden do not work, what's going to happen is that there's going to be an accident and you don't get pizza. So you can think of normal cell, happy, you get pizza. Cancer cell, unhappy, accident, no pizza. <laughs> and so a normal cell, all signaling pathways work. It only proliferates when it's needed. It can undergo apoptosis, and it only grows in its tissue of origin. A cancer cell, we have defective signaling pathways, and now proliferation signals are always on. The cell cannot undergo apoptosis, and it is able to grow on other tissues. So it's able to, to undergo metastasis. So now that you know those two terms, you're going to have to remember those for, for later. But I figured this was a nice time to do a break. So at, at the beginning of the talk, I said that for me, like the, um, the compounds are a little bit like um, treasure. And I wanted to show you how, you know, the search for one of these particular compounds. And Amy asked me to say that she was not the only one that was excited. I was in that same sub trip that I'm about to show you. And we were very excited because we had found an activity in this particular organism and we were trying to collect more of it. And so this video will show you that. What is this right here? It's just under the arm. I'm going to back up just a bit. Be one of them covered with sediment? Uh, I don't know. We could suck it up just in case. I don't know what that is. There's some sand. I, yeah, I don't think that's no? that. No? Okay. It could be. I don't know. Uh, I don't no, it might be the no. potato sponge. Is that there, right out on the top? You see that little white? I see it. I don't know. You think that's uh, where the ball is? Oh yeah, that's. Oh wow. Could be. Could be. I don't know. Okay, which button am I not using? Uh, right. Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna, I don't want to whack the camera here. I think that. I think might, that's yeah, it. It's that's it. it. Yay! And there's another one back behind Yay! there. Yeah, all right, Amy. Gun. Good. Okay, so there he is, sample number three, the 
Echinoderm. Woohoo! Woo woo woo! Okay, in the process of uh, finding or uh, picking up a sponge, old Eagle Eye Amy spotted uh, one of our target here, so we got one of the. Um, There's another little one right back behind. Uh, kind of derms. Uh, looks like we got maybe one or two in this area. We're going to collect them here as well. We got a search pattern. Woohoo! Woohoo! I think that's okay. him, the big picture. That's him. Okay. Her, it, yeah. whatever. That looks good. Okay. Those are them. Those are our babies. Right. So. Uh, we can just uh, suck them in. I've got okay. some more picture or video here right take, now. Uh, more pictures. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Right, look at that. So they're off. So why was this sea cucumber treasure? So the reason we were so excited, and trust me, I was jumping just as much as Amy. They just didn't videotape me, so I got lucky. <laughs> it contains an NF kappa B inhibitor. So I'm going to try to convince you why NF-kappa-B inhibitors are exciting. So this is what follows. So what is NF-kappa-B? The nuclear factor kappa-B is a transcription factor. And what that means is that when you start the signaling for this molecule, at the end, you're going to get the production of genes that are going to result in new proteins being made. And uh, nuclear factor kappa-B or NF-kappa-B mediates inflammation. It can inhibit programmed cell death or apoptosis, and it's activated by a variety of stimuli, including the binding by most inflammatory cytokines. However, it is constitutively active in many pancreatic cancer cells, and that is bad because it leads to very high proliferation rates, it, it leads to ap resistance to apoptosis, and it increases the metastatic potential of any cell that has constitutively active NF-kappa-B. And now we're going to use that term, the signal transduction. So this is a little bit of the signal transduction for NF-kappa-B. And NF-kappa-B is kept sequestered in the cytoplasm by an inhibitor called I-kappa-B. We're very original with our names. But whenever you get um, inflammatory stimuli, such as uh, uh, signaling by cytokines such as TNF-alpha or interleukin-1, you get the phosphorylation of I-kappa-B. When I-kappa-B becomes phosphorylated, it can phosphorylate NF-kappa-B, and phosphorylated I-kappa-B then gets released from NF-kappa-B. I-kappa-B gets targeted for degradation, and phosphorylated NF-kappa-B can then translocate into the nucleus, it can bind to DNA, and it can um, transcribe many anti-apoptotic genes, just as surviving BCLXL, XIAP, or FLIP, it can transcribe genes that control cell cycle progression, such as cycling D1 and surviving. And it, can, it transcribes many other genes. Uh, NF-kappa-B regulates about 250 different genes. So the way we're looking for inhibitors of NF-kappa-B is by using a reporter cell line. So we have an engineer lung cancer cell line that contains a luciferase reporter gene for NF-kappa-B activity. And what that means is that any time that I activate NF-kappa-B, I'm going to get light production. So then I can see if something has inhibited by seeing a decrease in the light production that I'm seeing. And the way that works is we activate our cells using TNF-alpha. And TNF-alpha starts a signaling cascade that will phosphorylate I-kappa-B. If it was for late NF-kappa B, I-kappa B gets degraded. NF-kappa B now goes into the nuclei. It um, binds to DNA. It transcribes all the same genes that NF-kappa B does. But in this reporter cell line, we also transcribe luciferin. And when I combine luciferase with that luciferin, I get production of light, and I can monitor that in my lab. And this is an example of what my screening looks like. So here you have the, um, our library of pure compounds. Again, we're expressing um, um, the amount of, of light as a, as a relative percentage, uh, giving our most um, our, our solvent control 100%, and media that never saw cells are zero, or our negative control. We use resveratrol, which is a compound that is present in wine, um, as our positive control. Again, you need a lot of it <laughs> to get that. So. I like wine, but I don't know that I can drink that much. But um, as you can see, we had compounds that had in, that inhibited NF-kappa B activity. Altogether, we have screened 89 pure compounds and about 2,000 peak library samples. 
Uh, we did secondary testing to validate it, and what that means is that we did a different assay to confirm that we saw inhibition of NF-kappa B. Um, the hits corresponded to three different kinds of organisms, and 21 compounds that inhibit NF-kappa B have been identified. And these are examples of invertebrates, of marine invertebrates that contain peak library hits for NF-kappa B, and you may recognize this guy. Uh, but in addition to sea cucumbers, we also have sponges and other organisms that have NF-kappa B inhibitors. And these are an example of some of their structures. As you can see, some are, are very simple, some are very complicated. And now I'm going to show you, so I told you, anytime that I find an activity, I need to figure out how on earth that activity is, found, is it's obtained um, or do the mechanism of action studies to really understand how the process works. We need to know how specific it is. We need to try to understand how it is acting in the cells because that will determine um, the potential future of the compound and whether it can make it as a drug. So I took a sponge trial and microscleroderma A and I did further testing with them. So the first test that I did was to determine the IC50, and this is a number that we use a lot to determine the potency of a, of a compound, and IC50 is basically the concentration needed to obtain 50% inhibition of a certain activity. In this case, it's um, NF-kappa B inhibition. A spongia trial had an IC50 of 3.4 micromolar. Uh, Microscleroderma A had an IC50 of 1.2 micromolar. Um, another technique that I use a lot in my lab um, is flow cytometry. And flow cytometry allows me to, to shoot cells in single cell formation through a liquid and pass them through a laser. And based on the way that the light gets scattered, I can learn about the cell shape and the size of it. But by using fluorescent antibodies, I can also learn about those signal transduction molecules inside of the cell. So for example here, um, we use an antibody that is specific for phosphorylated or active NF-kappa B. And these are untreated uh, a, uh, PANG1 cells. So it's a pancreatic cancer cell line. And you can see that they have quite a bit of um, NF-kappa B. So the more to the right, the more positive, the more to the left, more negative. And these uh, are the same cells treated with one of our compounds. So you can see that there was a significant decrease in the amount of activated NF-kappa B that was present in this particular example. So we did this same study with spongia trial and microscleroderma A. So here you have our vehicle control, and this is the amounts of NF-kappa B that are present. And you can see that when I treat with two times the IC50 for a spongia trial, I see a marked reduction in the levels of phosphorylated NF-kappa B that are present. When I present this as a graph and I normalize everything to vehicle control, making that 100%, you can see that a spongia trial caused about a 50% reduction in the amount of NF-kappa B, uh, active NF-kappa B that is present in this particular pancreatic cancer cell line. And you can see that um, microscleroderma A caused about a 40% decrease of the amount of NF-kappa B present on those cells. So next, we wanted to see if um, these compounds were able to kill the pancreatic cancer cell lines. So we have four different kinds of pancreatic cancer cell lines that we were using in these studies. Um, the ASPC ones are the most, more metastatic and more apoptotic resistant cell line that we have, the most um, apoptotic and most ap uh, uh, metastatic. And uh, you can see that spongia trial had um, um, an IC50 in the low micromolar range. Microscleroderma A was even more potent. And interestingly, one of the cells in which it was the most potent was in the ASPC1. So we were very, very excited about that. And because I told you that NF-kappa B Re, uh, regulates apoptosis, it was important to see whether the cytotoxicity that we were seeing was indeed apoptosis. So we use a technique that, call, that is called terminal deoxynucleotide transferase, DUTP, NIC, and label, or tunnel. 
And what that means, so one of the hallmarks of apoptosis is that you get DNA fragmentation. So your DNA gets cut into little pieces as the cell is undergoing apoptosis. So I'm using a nucleotide that has a fluorescent label, and that attaches to all the NIC pieces, all the little pieces of DNA that are cut. So the more pieces of DNA, the more fluorescent labeling that you will have, the more intact your DNA, the least fluorescent label that you're going to get. And so you can see, for example, here are methanol cells. Um, they are very intact. They're not undergoing apoptosis. And so there's hardly any fluorescent labeling. When I treat with 2.4 micrograms per mil sponge trial, you can see a small induction of um, uh, apoptosis here. When I treat with microscleroderm A, you can see a very significant increase of um, cells undergoing apoptosis. And this is done on the ASPC1 cell line, but I did it on all the cell lines that I had shown before. So this is the ASPC1, this is the VXPC3, the MIA packet 2 and the PANG1. And you can see that Spongia trial induced very modest but significant apoptosis in the ASPC1 and the PANG1 cells, while Microscleroderm A produced very significant and very robust apoptosis in the ASPC1, the VXPC3, and the PANG1 cell line. So the approach that we follow is called forward chemical genetic approach. And what that means is that we use a small library um, of, uh, we use a library of small molecules uh, to treat our cells. Um, and we select those small molecules that produce the phenotype that we are interested in. But we have to yet identify the protein that the small molecules bind. So if you think about the acids that I just showed you, I just showed you that I have compounds that inhibit NF-kappa V activity, but I don't know how that inhibition is happening. So we need to figure out that. So in order to do this, I decided to go forward with microscleroderm A, and I use a technique that is called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And PCR allows you to amplify the number of copies of a specific region of DNA. Um, and the way we do this, so this is DNA, this is the double helix, and we denature that DNA so it becomes linearized and it becomes single-stranded. Once that DNA has been denatured, we proceed to what we call the annealing step. And in this step, we add forward and reverse primers. So there are primers that bind the end of the region of interest. And um, we lower the temperature to allow them to bind. Once that has happened, we do the extension part of the process, where we add nucleotides that are going to come in and fill in all the gaps and try to make two copies. So at the end of the day, we start with one copy, and we end with two copies of that. Then this, we, the more cycles we do, we go from two copies to four copies to eight copies, and so on and so forth. The technique that we're using is called real-time or quantitative PCR. And it follows the same process that I described, except that we add a fluorescent dye that only fluoresces when it's bound to double-stranded DNA. So when I have one copy, I get this amount of fluorescent. As I go to my denaturing, annealing, and um, polymerization steps, I end up with my product. So now I have two copies. And of course, there's going to be more fluorescence here than it's here. And I can track that. And that allows me to have a quantitative idea of how much product I'm making of my particular DNA that I'm interested in. And so the data that we obtain with real-time PCR looks a little bit like this. And if you see, for example, this blue line, you can see that we start making copies of this particular gene product at about cycle 16, and we make about 2,000 copies of that. If you um, follow this pink line, on the other hand, you can see that we didn't start making copies of that until cycle 28, and we made only about 800 copies of it. So that allows you to have a quantitative thing that we can compare our treated cells, so our cells that were treated with microscleroderm A, versus cells that were not treated. And so we use what we call an NF-kappa V pathway-specific array. It contains primers for 84 genes that are important in that NF-kappa V pathway. And by comparing the microscleroderm A treated cells to our vehicle control cells, we can get an idea of where in the pathway microscleroderm A is affecting NF-kappa V.
And so this is an example of what that data looks like. So we can group them now. Now we're comparing our microscleroderm and um, A-treated cells versus our control group. And all the ones that are in this region show no difference. But we saw some genes that were overexpressed due to treatment and some genes that were underexpressed due to treatment. And we can make a table of that and it looks something like this. So here are the genes that were overexpressed. Some of them, it was quite significantly overexpressed. And you can see all the ones that were underexpressed. However, this is looking at it at the level of genes. And uh, the gene level doesn't always translate to protein level. And it is at the level of protein that things happen. So it is very important to validate these arrays to make sure that what we're seeing actually translate into something functional. So, the first thing that we did is kind of group this, um, these genes. So the ones that I highlighted here um, that were overexpressed, they completely tie in with NF-kappa B inhibition because these three genes, this is I-kappa B, um, this is BCL3 and TNF-AP3, all of them keep NF-kappa B sequestered at the cytoplasm. So if we have more of them, then you will have more sequestering to the cytoplasm and less active NF-kappa B. So we were happy about those results. All the genes that you see um, with the arrow here belong to the toll-like receptor pathway. And this is a pathway that is very important in recognizing bacterial infections, but it signals through NF-kappa B. So again, if we had downregulated that pathway, it will make sense that we will see less NF-kappa B. But when we validated the array and we look at protein levels, and I'm using flow cytometry again to use this, um, these are the levels of I kappa B alpha, and as you can see, the changes were not significant and similar to TNF-AIP3. We really didn't see any changes at the level of protein that went along with those gene changes. When we look at the toll-like receptor pathway, again, we are not seeing an increase or a decrease in this particular pathway due at the protein level. Um, one of the things, this was done at six hours, the gene array was done at six hours, so we thought maybe it's a matter of kinetics, but we repeated the experiment at 24 hours and we got exactly the same results. Um, one of the things that we had seen that was a little worrisome was this particular gene, these two genes. Um, this um, gene controls a protein that is called TRAIL, which stands for TNF-related associated inducing ligand. And that, this is a big name to describe what we call a dead receptor. So these dead receptors can control apoptosis induction. So it is very important, especially um, for cancer, most cancer cells are killed through trail. So you do not want trail to be downregulated. And when we validated this at the protein expression, we saw that indeed we're not affecting trail levels. So that was a good, good thing. One thing that we saw that really, really worried us were, were these results. So if you look at here, you remember I told you IL-8 brings the mast cells into the pancreas. It helps to facilitate that microenvironment that we do not want to have. And we saw it overexpressed due to microscleroderm and A treatment. We also saw TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1 beta. And this really, really puzzled us because dogma has it, if you inhibit NF-kappa B, you should inhibit IL-8. And lo and behold, we didn't. So we are seeing an increase on IL-8 expression due to microscleroderm and A treatment. Now, one of the things that, that was in the previous array were two molecules that are called FOS and June. And FOS and June control another transcription factor that is called AP1. And recent studies have shown that AP1 may also regulate levels of IL-8. So we thought, okay, so if the upregulation of FOS and June um, also occur, then maybe AP1 is responsible for this increase on IL-8 and it doesn't have anything to do with NF-kappa B. And indeed, we saw an increase on both phosphorylated FOS and phosphorylated June. I did that backwards. But um, so those will activate AP1 and that will regulate IL-8 expression. 
But we're still a little worried about that increase and what might mean. So we need to do functional assays to see exactly what is happening with this. So one thing that we always tell people is that, yes, we're trying to find potential therapeutics, but sometimes we might actually end up with things that help us understand pathways better. So I told you, dogma has it, if you go to the literature, that if I inhibit NF-kappa B, I should inhibit IL-8. Well, we have proof here that that's not always the case. So at the very least, microscleroderma A will help us understand more of those signaling pathways because we obviously do not have all the answers. But what is the mechanism of action of microscleroderma A? Well, in pancreatic cancer, there's another way in which NF-kappa B can be regulated, and this is through a molecule called the glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. And when my, uh, glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta is always active, and you want it to be active, it is a very important molecule that regulates glycogen production. It helps regulate the sugar levels in your blood. Um, it regulates also cell cycle progression and tubulin polymerization. Um, but it activates NF-kappa B. And when NF-kappa B is active, you have inhibiting, inhibition of apoptosis and you have cell cycle progression. However, if you inhibit GSK3 beta through an influx of insulin, through growth factors or through drugs such as lithium, um, the inactivation of, of GSK3 beta leads to the inactivation of NF-kappa B and in pancreatic cancer, that has been shown to lead to apoptosis. And so we decided to look at this pathway, and what we expect to see is an increase on phosphorylated AKT, which is upstream of GSK3 beta, an increase on phosphorylated GSK3 beta, a decrease on phosphorylated NF-kappa B, which I already showed you, and an increase on phosphocycline D, which is downstream of NF-kappa B. So it seems like microscleroderma A is going through this pathway to inhibit NF-kappa B. So our conclusions on the regulators of inflammation is that we have identified marine compounds that inhibit NF-kappa B. Their activity has been confirmed in secondary assays. Functional assays is still need to be performed. But for the non-compounds, spongia trial and microscleroderma A, inhibition of NF-kappa B is a new activity. Um, their molecular targets still are yet to be determined. And microscleroderma A may inhibit NF-kappa B through inhibition of the glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. So I just want to acknowledge some of the people that have done some of this work. Georges Califatidis is my postdoc, and he has been working really, really hard at getting that degranulation assay up and running. Tara, D, and Pat have been, are technicians in the lab that have helped with the screening and some of the assays that you have seen today. Mike Gerbes, Lexi, and Kelly have been, um, were undergraduate summer interns that uh, had some part on these projects. Um, and this work was funded by an NIH RO3 for the mass cell work and a state of Florida Banghead Collie for um, the regulators of inflammation. And I thank Brian for providing me the video. And of course, I thank everybody that is part of the Center for Marine Biomedical and Biotechnology Research. We are truly a multidisciplinary and collaborative group. And we really, you know, everybody is involved in the success that we all accomplish. And I wanted to leave you with some images of our latest treasure. So these are some of the samples that we collected on our last research cruise last year. And we have yet to identify the compounds that are within these um, marine invertebrates, but I'm hoping that some of them might have compounds that could be one day cures against pancreatic cancer. And with that, I will take any questions.